Several beachfront homes simply toppling into the Atlantic Ocean, collapsing after Nicole made landfall as a Category 1 hurricane. Several other properties are now at imminent risk, and thousands across the state are without power. Nicole is now moving up the coast and will push into the northeast. We're tracking the storm. The battle for control of Congress, several races still too close to call, leaving a future balance of power up in the air, plus the latest on the tight governor's race in Arizona. Russia makes a retreat in Kherson, possibly marking the biggest setback for Vladimir Putin since the start of the war. But there are fears now that the withdrawal could be a trap. A moment that may be hard to watch. First responders are seen on a video rushing to save a one-month-old baby with RSV after she stopped breathing. She did survive what her mother is now saying about the terrifying ordeal. Four mothers talk about being united in tragedy. All of their sons were killed in fraternity hazings. You shouldn't go off to college and not come home. 29 days later. Now that tragedy has fostered passion. The federal legislation, they say, will give other families the tools to keep their children safe. When COVID forced people into isolation, many started to lose hope and doubt their life decisions. Former First Lady Michelle Obama says she was one of them. All that we had done, especially after the election, did it matter? And does anything matter, right? She sits down with Robin Roberts to discuss how her new book is shining a light on her healing journey. She's the star of a hit Disney Plus series opposite John Stamos, but millions of fans are most familiar with her humorous skits on TikTok. Sarah Echegaray tells us how she went from a social media influencer to a TV star. I think it's just a dream that so very little can accomplish, and I'm just so grateful and proud of myself as well. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. 48 hours after polls began closing in midterms, votes are still being counted tonight, and the fate of which party will control Congress remains in limbo. More on that in just a moment, because we want to get right to Hurricane Nicole's deadly wrath and the fallout from the strongest storm to hit Florida this late in the year in roughly four decades. The hurricane made landfall around 3 this morning near Florida's Vero Beach with 75 mile per hour winds. The storm has left a path of destruction behind, including including areas where Hurricane Ian struck just six weeks ago. In Daytona Beach shores, powerful waves eroded entire foundations. At least 19 hotels and condo buildings are severely damaged. The storm surge rushed through neighborhoods and flooded streets. Tonight, Nicole is moving quickly from Tampa into South Carolina and toward the East Coast. In a moment, Rob Marciano will have more on where Nicole is heading next, but Victor Akendo leads us off from Daytona Beach shores. Tonight, a rare November hurricane cutting a path of destruction along Florida's Atlantic coast. The latest landfall in nearly 40 years. Authorities say at least 19 hotels and condos, as well as 40 homes in Volusia County, have been damaged or destroyed. There's some buildings that have been partially collapsed. Dan Freebus has lived in Daytona Beach Shores for 64 years. He says it will never be the same. How many people had to evacuate in this area? I had four or five people walk up to me wondering where they're going to live. In nearby Daytona Beach, the powerful storm surge and massive waves causing severe erosion, sending multiple beachfront homes collapsing into the ocean, this swimming pool dangling on the edge. Our Ginger Z is there. This home yesterday, I was in the living room. That is now in the ocean. They used to have, before Ian, a deck and 100 feet before you hit water. This is how fast erosion can change a coast. These homes... We're not sitting on cliffs two months ago. No. Tell me about what it looked like before Ian and before Nicole. We've heard people say you shouldn't build on a cliff. There, there weren't cliffs here. These were not cliffs. These were the walkovers that were, again, you had a ton of space. So this is just, it's just absolutely devastating. Nicole roaring ashore in the middle of the night, making landfall near Vero Beach as a Category 1 storm. Wind gusts topping 80 miles per hour, ripping down trees and power lines. Nicole blamed for at least four deaths tonight, including a man and woman electrocuted by a down power line in Orange County. Nicole dumping more than half a foot of rain, combined with the storm surge, triggering major flooding in St. Augustine and parts of Jacksonville. And tonight, NASA inspecting the $4 billion Artemis I moon rocket for damage after officials kept it on the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. That area blasted with intense wind gusts when Nicole came ashore.
Victor Kendo joins us now from Dayton Beach Shores. And Victor, even though the storm has now moved out, it, it seems that the danger remains. Right, Lindsay, especially with so much of the seawall and the coastline just torn apart, there is real concern of more collapses. The ground, it is incredibly unstable right now. That's why you have to see so many evacuations. Lindsay? All right, Victor, stay safe. Now let's get straight to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano with more on where Nicole is heading next. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay. Well, Georgia and Atlanta, it's next on the docket here. But right now, Nicole is dipping his toes back into water in the Gulf of Mexico, just south of Tallahassee. Here it is on the radar. You see that swirl there. It'll move inland soon enough, about 80 miles south of Tallahassee, but the impacts well away from center. Tropical storm force winds 175 miles out, and we have tornado warning earlier today in Charleston. Tornado watches have been extended into North Carolina, so that will be an overnight threat. Our computer models bring this north to just south of Atlanta by tomorrow morning. It's going to be a rainy, windy rush hour here in the ATL. And then as it pushes up across the Appalachians, even slicing across the Ohio River Valley, we'll see a severe weather threat for parts of the Carolinas. Then into the mid-Atlantic by midday and then pushing into the northeast. Look at the heavy rain coming into Philadelphia, into Newark and New York by the rush hour tomorrow afternoon. And there'll be some heavy rain and obviously some wind with this. How much rain do we expect? Well, good news is it's moving fairly quickly. So the inland flooding that we so are worried about with, with hurricanes uh, probably won't materialize, but there'll be spotty areas of seeing some flooding. I think coastal flooding and coastal erosion will be the calling card here, but the wind and the rain will certainly down, take down more trees and power lines over the next 24 to 36 hours. Lindsay? Glad to hear it's at least moving quickly. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Now to the aftermath of another storm, the midterms with control of Congress still up in the air. Who holds the Senate majority depends on the outcome of three states, Georgia, which is heading to a runoff, and Arizona and Nevada, which are both still too close to call. So when will we know which way voters in those states cast their ballots? ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran reports from Phoenix tonight. Here in Maricopa County, they're counting the votes and they've still got a long way to go. More than 400,000 ballots are left. The Republican chairman of the county board tells us that in Arizona, when 90% of the voters vote by mail, this is how elections work. There's nothing wrong with it, what's going on. This is the process. It's been like this for years. Each ballot must be signature checked, scanned, and verified by a bipartisan board by law. Candidates in the tight Senate race reassuring their supporters. Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly. It doesn't look like we're going to have the final results for a little while. And that's okay. And his Republican opponent, Blake Masters, tweeting simply, with the remaining ballots outstanding, we are confident we will win. In Nevada, ballots postmarked by Election Day are still arriving. Officials here explaining each one will be verified and counted, a painstaking process. We couldn't go any faster now, even if we wanted to. But like Arizona, the candidates here, too, remain in calm. We know this will take time, and uh, we won't have more election results for several days. We're confident that the numbers are there and we're gonna win this race. Arizona's Democratic candidate for governor also urged patience. Prepare for a long evening and a few more days of counting. But her Republican opponent, Carrie Lake, a longtime election denier, taking a darker tone. We had a big day today and don't let those cheaters and crooks think anything different. Today, Lake suggested a conspiracy is at work, accusing officials of deliberately, quote, slow rolling the results, but offering no proof. A few theories floating out there. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, we heard that Nevada officials say that we couldn't go any faster here if we wanted to, but you heard of one issue in Nye County that slowed down the count. What happened there? Uh, Lindsay Young, I believe it's in Nye County. Election deniers, very suspicious of voting machines, have decided to hand count all the ballots. That hasn't gone very well. The first 50 ballots took uh, about three hours uh, to actually verify by a handful of volunteers. A judge came in at one point and decided they had to stop because they weren't allowed to announce people's votes. That was a violation of the state law. And now uh, officials in Nye County are pleading for volunteers to come and help them count the other thousands and thousands of ballots by hand. Luckily, a judge had previously ordered uh, that by state law, they were also required to have the machine count going. But that's just one example of the kind of disruption that can happen 
these days, given the lack of trust some people have in the elections. Right, and we've heard that the machines can count them as quickly as 45 seconds per ballot. So obviously doing it by hand extends the process by quite a bit. Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. Let's turn now to ABC News political director Rick Klein, who's back in Washington. Rick, all eyes, of course, still on Nevada and Arizona. Just break down for us which counties still have votes to report and whether or not the political makeup of those counties could swing the current count. Yeah, Lindsay, it's two sides of, uh, of the same coin. You've got one state where the Democrat is up a little bit, the other state where the Republican is up a little bit, and they're looking to that outstanding vote at this hour. Uh, starting in the state of Nevada, we've had a pretty consistent lead as the vote count has come in for the Republican, uh, Adam Laxalt, uh, but we're looking at a large number of votes, uh, at least a couple hundred thousand that are still to come out of both Las Vegas in the Reno area, uh, Washoe, as well as, uh, as well as Clark counties. And both of those counties have been Democratic in the past. So as that float, uh, that vote flows in, it might close the margin for Cortez Masto. As you can see, she's been winning in Clark County. Uh, and then if you if you go out to, to uh, neighboring Arizona, kind of a different story. We just got a, a big a big group of votes in at a Pima County, which is the Tucson area. Mark Kelly is winning big in that county. Right now, he is up by almost 100,000 votes. But in Phoenix uh, and in Maricopa County, we we're talking about upwards of 400,000 additional votes. And there's some reason to think that they might be a little bit more Republican because a lot of those votes, even though they were technically early votes or mail-in votes, they were dropped off on Election Day itself, which is something that Republicans were urging their supporters to do. And looking to the House now, what's the current state of play there on the contests that are still outstanding? It is remarkable that, uh, that, that 48 full hours later, we still don't know who's going to control the House. We were getting some indications, though. You can see right now, uh, under our, in our own projections and our own analyses of these races, Republicans are going to control at least 211 seats in the new Congress. 218, though, is the magic number. They need only seven more. Democrats need a, a little bit more help. But a lot of the races that haven't been projected yet are on that Democratic side of the aisle. You can see the red ones, those are switches, those are party switches that have been won by Republicans. But these blue ones over here are Republican held seats that were held that are now going to be held by Democrats. So at this hour, it looks more likely than not that Republicans are going to control the House, but it is going to be a very, very narrow margin. All right, Rick Klein, our thanks to you as always. Thanks, Lindsay. The economy is certainly a major issue for so many midterm voters. And today we finally saw some good news when it comes to inflation. Consumer prices in October rose by 7.7% compared to a year ago, but that's down from last month, showing some signs of cooling. The stock market rocketed up on the news. The Dow Jones average up 1,200 points on the day. The NASDAQ also jumping over the 7% on the day. Let's bring in ABC's chief business and economics correspondent, Miss Rebecca Jarvis, to break it all down for us. So, Rebecca, why is it this report being seen as such a positive sign on Wall Street. Well, Lindsay, when you look at this report, it's a sign that we've turned a corner. That's how Wall Street reads it as far as inflation is concerned. And it looks at this report as a signal that the Federal Reserve's aggressive rate hikes are working and that lowers the probability there will need to be more aggressive rate hikes going forward. Now, there very likely will be some, but they won't be as consequential. And that's good news for borrowing costs. We've seen mortgages this year spike higher today in addition to the stock market rallying, you saw 30-year fixed rate mortgages go down from 7.2% to 6.6%. So cheaper borrowing costs for people going out to buy uh, homes. Of course, no one's going to call that cheap at 6.6% considering where we were at the beginning of the year, more than double uh, where we were. But Lindsay, the bottom line here is historic inflation. Looks like it's turned a corner, but it remains high. We started the year with American families paying about $500 more on the same goods and services because of inflation. That was back in June. Now we're looking at about $433 more a month. So still considerable, but not what it was. Lindsay? Rebecca Jarvis, we appreciate you as always breaking it down for us. Now to the war in Ukraine and staggering new figures on the toll taken by the war. An estimated 100,000 killed or injured on each side, 200,000 casualties and another 40,000 civilians killed. This is the Russian retreat from a key city continues tonight, but some Ukrainian officials fear it may be a trap. ABC's James Longman has more. 
Tonight, reports of explosions in the city of Kherson. Ukrainian troops are moving closer after Russia announced its withdrawal. These videos shared by Ukrainian soldiers show villages in the area being liberated. They found Russian positions deserted and Ukrainian flags and villagers welcoming them. But some top Ukrainian officials are warning of a trap that the Russians are laying mines and readying artillery strikes to turn it into a, quote, city of death. The retreat comes after weeks of relentless pressure. This aerial reconnaissance unit has been operating in the Kherson region. How important would you say your work is at the moment? Uh, OK, I understand. Uh, where are the eyes of the army? Actually, because uh, uh, previously it was very hard to help the artillery from uh, like uh, from the ground level. Now this is the, obviously the drone here. It gets loaded up uh, with this grenade that would normally sit uh, under the barrel of a gun. You've got the detonator at the front here, and then this at the back. This is a fin which has been attached, and that's been made using a 3D printer. And in a show of its continued support for Ukraine, the United States is now providing powerful new defensive weapons. They include short-range air defense missiles that can protect against cruise missiles, helicopters and unmanned drones. The US believes Putin's setbacks have now opened a window of opportunity for talks. But Ukraine believes it's tried negotiation with the Russian leader and has never kept his word. James joins us now from Ukraine. James, with so much distrust, where does this leave the chances for negotiation? Well, Lindsay, negotiation, it's a bit of a dirty word here in Ukraine. Uh, most Ukrainians think that's part of Russia's attempt to spin a bad situation for them. They've withdrawn from Kherson. And so now, sort of cynically, they're going to say, well, no, look, now's the time for us to talk, knowing full well that Kyiv will not do that. Russia wants to be able to say to the world, we were the ones ready to negotiate, but look, Ukraine wants to carry on this war. But they know that Kyiv has a certain number of conditions. President Zelensky has made it clear he will not talk while so much of the country is occupied. He wants them to take responsibility for war crimes. He wants reparations. And you might say all that would be part of a negotiation, but this isn't a conversation about some third entity, some third party. Their own country has been invaded and occupied. And you hear it time and time again here from Ukrainians. What part of your country would you give up? They say that about the United States. Imagine if half of the US was occupied, would you just give them Texas as a consolation prize? That's how Ukraine's, Ukrainians feel about this. Uh, and so at the moment in this war where they are winning, uh, there is patriotism coursing through their veins and they are not willing to give up. They feel like it is an outright military win. That is what they want. So it just does not feel Feel like a negotiation is on the table at this point. Lindsay? All right, you've crystallized it so well for us all. James, thank you. The surge of RSV cases in children are at the highest levels in recent memory as we're seeing the heart-stopping moments play out across the country. It all became too real for one family in particular. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, the harrowing moments two Missouri police officers race to rescue a one-month-old baby yes, after she stopped breathing. Body camera video showing them take little Kamaya into their arms, immediately performing life-saving CPR. She's, I could feel her. Within seconds, the baby is go. breathing again. She's breathing now. She is breathing. There you go. There we go. There you go. Kamaya rushed to the hospital where she was diagnosed with the respiratory illness RSV and given breathing support. The Kansas City police officers visiting her in the hospital. The parents told us that she was doing okay. It was, it was a great moment. Severe RSV cases in children soaring to levels not seen in recent memory this fall, helping drive pediatric hospital bed occupancy to its highest level nationwide in two years. Premature babies like Kamaya among the most at risk. Kamaya's mother hailing those officers heroes. He's a hero. Like, he's my hero. He's my daughter's hero. I'm very grateful for that man. He saved my daughter's life. Lindsay, tonight, little Kamaya is back home and doing well. Doctors praising those officers, saying that they did the right thing by using chest compressions, and they are urging families to learn CPR because it can be life-saving. Lindsay? Ariel, thanks so much. When we come back, the unbelievable video of the suspect teased after jumping into a daycare play area with children around. Former First Lady Michelle Obama sits down with our Robin Roberts, how she got through the pandemic. But up next, finding purpose. We follow four mothers of hazing victims and their incredible call to action to stop the practice from happening and claiming any more lives. Their remarkable fight coming up next. Stay with us.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Take a look at this startling body camera recorded in Warren, Ohio, of a suspect being tased after jumping into a play area with children all around. Police say the person wanted for assault forced his way into the daycare facility. Initially, officers were worried he had a gun. After they tased him, they urged teachers to pull the kids out of the way. Fortunately, none of them were injured. Bound by grief, motivated by motherhood, there is a mission that has been found in the depths of sadness for a group of mothers who lost their sons in hazing incidents. A legislative change to hold fraternities and sororities on college campuses accountable for the young students who rush. Our Keir Phillips sat down with four mothers who share their stories of heartache and hope. It's a moment 18 years in the making. I was so excited about it, truly excited about school probably for the first time in his life. Heading off to college. He was 18, you know, he had everything in front of him. Dreams and destinies about to be defined. He just was very ambitious. And for the parents, saying goodbye is always so bittersweet. When we were leaving him at LSU that day and he was so happy. But for these four mothers, those emotional farewells would be their last. When you look at that photo now, what goes through your mind? I almost didn't take that picture because, um, you know, I wanted to live in the moment. A moment Ray Ann Groover, Evelyn Piazza, Kathleen Wyant, and Carol King will never experience with their boys again. What's the one thing you miss the most about Tim? Just everything. I miss everything. They tell us they are bonded by fraternity hazing and heartbreak. You shouldn't go off to college and not come home 
29 days later. These four fearless moms are determined to make a difference. We're uniquely qualified. We're saying don't haze because this is what happens and this is the damage that it does. Rayanne's son, Max, was a freshman at Louisiana State University when he lost his life at the age of 18. Campus police say Max died after an hours-long hazing ritual called Bible study. Pledges reciting the Greek alphabet. But if you make a mistake, you're forced to drink alcohol. Max's cause of death, acute alcohol intoxication and asphyxiation. His blood alcohol level was 0.495%, more than six times the legal limit. He thought he found a group of guys that were a lot like him and, you know, they killed him. Evelyn's 19-year-old son, Tim, attended Penn State in 2017. The grim details of his hazing death shocking the nation. It was night one for Tim. He didn't get a choice. The investigation surrounding Tim's death revealed he had consumed at least 18 alcoholic drinks in less than two hours, leading to his fall down a flight of stairs. Fraternity members waited nearly 12 hours before calling 911. How did you process that when you learned about the surveillance video and that they were splashing water on his face and carrying him back up to the couch and trying to prop him up. I mean, hours and hours went by. How do you process that? This has been the summer of depositions. And I've seen some of the video that I swore I wasn't going to watch. And it's hard. It's really hard to know that somebody didn't value your son's life. Kathleen's 18-year-old son, Colin, attended University of Ohio in 2018. According to a lawsuit filed by his parents against the fraternity, which was settled last year without admitting wrongdoing, Colin endured weeks of extreme hazing. His cause of death? Asphyxiation after inhaling a canister of nitrous oxide. I still can't believe that he could get sucked into it, but now that I know so much about hazing, I realize anyone can get sucked into it. And Carol lost her 18-year-old son, Justin, at Bloomsburg University in 2019. The investigation finding Justin died after falling down an embankment while walking home from a fraternity party, where his parents allege in a lawsuit he was coerced into drinking. ABC reached out to Kappa Sigma, the fraternity declined to comment. Did any of you ever think that hazing would be an issue in your household with your boys? I never thought it would be him. You know, wrestler, baseball player, you know, the strongest kid around. Never thought it would be him. They just want to belong. Mm -hmm. For the past 62 years, at least one hazing-related death has been reported in the United States. And in a 2008 University of Maine survey, more than half of U.S. college students involved in university organizations say they have experienced some type of hazing. Why does it keep happening? Hazing is a cycle. The only reason people haze is because they were hazed. They think they're invincible and nothing's gonna happen to me or what I'm doing to this person. I never thought this would happen to Max. Not in a million years did I think my son would die because of hazing in a fraternity. It's Russian roulette. It's Russian roulette. These moms have now found solace in a circle of shared grief. Who else understands this? They do. They know that you went to the supermarket and you saw whatever snack that your kid loved and it like sent you spiraling and you went down the rabbit hole. They understand. Oh. Understanding turned into action. Everything that you all are doing in the midst of, of such grief. These moms, now advocates. Asking for co-sponsors for the End All Hazing Act. Forming the anti-hazing coalition with an unlikely alliance the North American Interfraternity Conference.
coming here to our nation's capital demanding change. We can't sit around and lose a kid in every state till we fix this problem. We just can't let that happen to that many other families. We need to take care of this on the federal level. These mothers lobbying for the End All Hazing Act, legislation that would require universities to keep a database that would disclose any violation that threatens the safety of students. How could this legislation save lives? Parents and students need to have that information in front of them, readily available, easy access, so you can make the right decision. We're giving them the information they need. And if this was in place, when I looked up that fraternity, he absolutely wouldn't have pledged. He would be here today. Did you ever expect that there'd be a higher purpose when, within all of this? I honestly think Max is up there like, you're doing this all for me? Wow, you really are a mama bear. Mama bears banging on doors. We tell everybody right. in Georgia everything you're doing for us. <laughs> Meeting with senators and representatives on all sides of the aisle. No other parent should ever have to go through something like this again. It's just, it's been excruciating. Six weeks after Max died, Andrew Coffey died at Florida State, and I remember falling to my knees. Like, how could this happen? Pushing to attach their bill to larger legislation to help get it passed, hoping to prevent other parents from such devastating loss. Will new legislation in any way feel like justice? It'll bring me some peace. I agree. But it won't. It won't bring justice. It won't bring Justin back. And if you had the opportunity now to say just one more thing to your boys, what would it be? Don't go. Such palpable pain there. Our thanks to Kira. Still ahead here on Prime, the investigation now underway after four Americans die of carbon monoxide poisoning while staying at separate places in Mexico. The teen arrested for threatening synagogues, prompting an FBI warning, and the multi-billion dollar collapse of the crypto behemoth FTX. We take a look at the we take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, just 10 days until the World Cup. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs and some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. If you don't mind, I'm going to warm up my voice in front of you. You have preconceived notions of what a pop star is going to be like, and he is not at all like that. You turn me well, this doesn't suck. Like a light switch. I wasn't exactly encouraged to tell my story. No one really knew me and what I was like. The impact of Charlie Puth. This is the song that I have to end every set with for the rest of my life. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Now to the cryptocurrency crash that has traditional markets on edge. One of the largest exchanges in the world, FTX, collapsed this week after a chain reaction set off by a leaked document that raised questions about the company's finances. Here's a look at how it all went down and the aftershocks now shaking the financial markets by the numbers. $500 million worth of FTT tokens. That's how much a competing exchange called Binance pulled out of FTX following the leak. The sales sent FTT prices plummeting. Six billion dollars. That's how much investors sold off over a three-day period, leaving the company scrambling for cash and ultimately agreeing to sell non-U.S. operations to Binance. But then they backed out of the deal, saying that the company's finances could not be saved. The collapse is sending ripples across the financial world. Bitcoin fell 16 percent. It's now down about 75 percent from its all-time high a year ago. The Nasdaq dropped about two and a half percent yesterday, and the Dow Jones and S&P both fell two percent as the crypto news added to investors' election jitters. And major corporate investors in FTX may be in for huge losses. Sequoia Capital told investors it's marking its $150 million investment down to zero. SoftBank Group and hedge fund Third Point are also major investors. Today, the Securities Commission of the Bahamas, where FTX is based, froze the company's assets and began the process of liquidating the company's assets. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. We take a closer look at the discrimination that so many with albinism have faced. And the social media turned Disney Plus star who got her start by posting acting clips. It's this week's TikTok. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. If you don't mind, I'm going to warm up my voice in front of you. You have preconceived notions of what a pop star is going to be like, and he is not at all like that. Well, this doesn't suck. I wasn't exactly encouraged to tell my story. No one really knew me and what I was like. The impact of Charlie Puth. This is the song that I have to end every set with for the rest of my life. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
The state of Florida is assessing the damage after a rare late season tropical system that slammed the state's Atlantic coast. Nicole made landfall just south of Vero Beach as a category one hurricane. The storm caused epic beach erosion all along the shore. In Volusia County, several homes lost their oceanfront patios and yards. Others were left teetering in the wind as gusts topped 75 miles per hour with a storm surge up to six feet. Massive waves ripped apart this pier in Deerfield Beach and wreaked havoc in Daytona. Erosion is so extensive, police forced the evacuation of more than half a dozen high-rise condos amid fears they could crumble and fall into the sea. President Biden will sit down with China's President Xi on the sidelines of the G20 World Leader Summit in Indonesia next Monday. This will be the first time the two have met in person since President Biden took office. The White House says the two leaders will discuss efforts to, quote, maintain and deepen lines of communication between the U.S. and China, responsibly manage competition, and work together where interests align. Topics on the agenda include Taiwan, human rights, the global economy, Russia and the war in Ukraine, and North Korea. The families of four tourists killed by carbon monoxide poisoning in two different Mexico City vacation rentals now demanding answers. Authorities say Americans Candace Florence, Jordan Marshall, and Cortez Hall were all found dead in their Airbnb rental on October 30th. Authorities say they arrived at the scene to find the bodies of the three friends all dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. Airbnb suspending the listing and canceling upcoming reservations, telling ABC News our priority is now now to provide support to those affected while the authorities investigate what happened. And we are available to cooperate with the investigation in any way we can. The Washington, D.C. Attorney General is suing the Washington Commanders, its owner, the NFL, and the league's commissioner. The Washington, D.C. Attorney General's office had launched an investigation into the Washington Commanders football team and its owner amid allegations of sexual harassment and a toxic workplace culture. In a new civil lawsuit, D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine alleges the team and Snyder, along with the NFL and NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, colluded to deceive residents about that investigation. Lawyers for the Washington Commanders released a statement saying the owners over two years ago acknowledged an unacceptable workplace culture. They apologized and called the lawsuit filled with falsehoods. A man accused of posting a broad online threat last week that spurred heightened security at Jewish synagogues and schools in New Jersey is now facing federal charges. Prosecutors say 18-year-old Omar Elkatul of Sayreville made the threat online back on November 1st, but he later told federal agents that he didn't have the nerve to carry out that threat. Prosecutors say his motive was his hatred for Jews and the belief that Jews support terror against Muslims. They say Al-Qatul was radicalized over the course of a year and was affiliated with Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. Convicted, he could face up to five years in prison. New toys going into the National Toy Hall of Fame. This year's class of classic toys announced today, Masters of the Universe action figures, the light bright, and one that dates back to ancient times, the top. The Toy Hall of Fame is part of the strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, and inducts toys that it says inspire creative play and have been popular over a sustained period of time. The three new inductees will join other past honorees, including the rubber duck, American Girl Dolls, and the Teddy Bear. In his latest short film, filmmaker Amir Kamova he is highlighting the discrimination that people of color with albinism experience. Set in America and inspired by real-life events, War of Colors revolves around the daily struggles of Rue, a young black woman with albinism, a rare inherited genetic condition that causes little or no pigmentation in their eyes, skin, or hair. Take a look. That's one of them albinos. Do you think it's contagious? I have never been called the N-word. However, I have been asked to say it to prove that I'm black. Joining us now is actress and model Deandra Forrest, who plays Rue and Amir Kamova, writer, director, and producer of War of Colors. And thank you both so much for joining us. Amir, let's start with you. This is not something that people talk about very often. I'm curious what inspired you to, to make such a hard-hitting film about an African-American woman with albinism? Yeah, definitely. Um, initially, I wanted to make a film from a personal standpoint. 
and two incidents I went through inspired me for the topic. Uh, first one is having vitiligo, which is different than albinism, but it's a skin disorder where y your pigments die and you have white patches on your skin. And the second incident was I witnessed uh, a black person with a light, lighter skin tone being called not real black by a white person and a black person on two different occasions. So combining these two, I came up with this topic and wanted to turn it into a film. DeAndre, is this something that you'd ever thought that, you know, I'd really love to do a film about this? Oh, absolutely. Um, through my whole modeling career, I have um, been big on advocacy for people with albinism. So when Amir came to me with the opportunity, I just knew it's something that I had to jump on board. And Amir, in several countries, men and women with albinism are attacked and dismembered in some cases because some people believe their body parts have medicinal value. In the U.S., albinism is rarely an issue of life and death, but, but it can dramatically affect the way that people are treated. In creating this film, how did you address the, the lack of knowledge that, that often leads to stigmatization? Yeah, um, I thought the best way to address that would be uh, hearing the issue from a person with albinism, which ended up being DeAndre's character. And I actually gave the character uh, like a three minute monologue to be able to just give her voice and talk about all these issues. We were talking with DeAndre while writing the script too. And we want to make sure we included the situations outside of the U.S. that you just mentioned uh, to be in the film. And as we've mentioned a bit, uh, being a, a person with albinism does come with constant stares, stigma, stereotypes, and discrimination, which your character in particular confronts at a slam poetry session. We have a clip of that. Let's take a look. Being black in America is a protest. Being black in America with white skin is revolutionary, but only because I refuse to fold to the insults and the fear that trap my character. I don't live in your America. I live in no man's land where beasts and ghosts and villains and powder color freaks roam. That's really powerful. De describe how you ultimately became more comfortable in your skin. Um, well, I think it had a lot to do with looking beyond my skin um, and really just finding myself um, things that I liked about myself, um, about my personality. I would imagine that it came with some kind of sense of self when you got signed, the first woman with albinism to get signed to a major model deal. What would your messaging be to young kids who are just trying to fit in, whether it's albinism or, or something else? What would you say? My message is really just to be yourself. Be yourself because there is no box to fit in. So what are you really trying to fit into? Be who you are, love who you are, and that should be more than enough. And Amir, there is some Oscar buzz around this. When you, when you set out doing the film, were you thinking, hey, this has the potential? Um, not really, but um, it's really exciting that um, it's happening because Obviously, our goal is to reach a wider audience and really like raise awareness and give voice to the community and hopefully contribute to the cause to make life easier for people with albinism. Deandra and Amir, we thank you both so much for joining us. Warm Colors will be available to view for select audiences. Thank you. Now to an ABC News exclusive with Michelle Obama. ABC News' Robin Roberts sat down with the former first lady as she prepares to release her new book, The Light We Carry. The book goes in depth about her life after leaving the White House at such a crucial time in America's history and what her relationship is like now with her husband, Barack Obama, and her two daughters. The former first lady, Michelle Obama, discussing life after the White House. I was sitting at home, um, you know, just sort of sorting through where we were, trying to make sense of what was happening to our country, to our world. Sharing her strategies for staying hopeful in her new book, The Light We Carry, Overcoming in Uncertain Times. And like a lot of people, I was trying to figure out how do we get in this mess and how do we get out of it. People trying to figure out how to make sense out of this stuff and, you know, for, for whatever reason, looking to me for an answer, you know? I struggled, like a lot of people, to find a sense of hope in all of this. You said the worry and isolation had driven me inward, yeah. backward. Yeah. I rediscovered all the unresolved questions I'd stashed on the shelves of my mind, all the doubts I'd previously tucked away. So it was that loss of hope 
you know, thinking about did all of this matter, all the sacrifice that my family, my husband and I, all that we had done, especially after the election, did it matter? And does anything matter, right? And I think that if you, you don't have the tools to get out of it, you can just spiral and spiral down, further down. Mrs. Obama candidly revealing how she keeps from worrying, naming items in what she refers to as her personal toolbox, like focusing on the small. One constant light she mentions, her husband, former President Barack Obama, their romance lasting over three decades. So last month, 30 mm -hmm. years. Your 30 year T anniversary. That's real time. That is Wouldn't real time. Say? How'd y'all celebrate? We went, we recreated our honeymoon. Um, I know, he did it. That dude came with it. Um, and when we laughed about how broke we were when we did it the first time. Um, but we rode along Highway 1 coast. We stopped in Big Sur and Carmel. That part of the country is one of the most beautiful coasts on the world. And the two other lights in your life, your daughters. Oh, those two. When you're, very, you're fiercely protective of mm -hmm. their private life, yes. but you did write about them, that mm -hmm. living together for time in Los Angeles, sharing an apartment, that mm -hmm. you and your husband come over for dinner. Yeah, watching them create their own version of home. They are sharing an apartment and, you know, it's just fun when you see your kids adulting in the world. And uh, they had invited us over before dinner to have cocktails at their apartment. And they had prepared a charcuterie tray and tried to make two very weak martinis. They realized they didn't have any of the ingredients, but they were trying to, they were hosting us. Um, and it's just fun watching them become uh, themselves. Joining us at the kitchen table, Mrs. Marion Robinson, affectionately known as Grandma in Chief. Are you coming for me? A rare glimpse of her sharing a whole lot of wisdom and wit. I don't think you knew I took the SAT. You know, it was one of those things we were all kind of just like, oh, you oh, you got into a school? Okay, well, how you gonna get there? Your education was your responsibility. It wasn't mine. I told her. I already graduated. <laughs> it's up to you <laughs> to get an education and get a job. <laughs> our thanks to Robin Roberts for that. And we turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Our next guest started by posting clips of acting skits online to starring in season two of the Disney Plus series Big Shot. TikTok sensation Sarah Echegaray, a 20-year-old Mexican-American and rising actress who's gained more than 7 million followers on the app simply doing what she loves. Sarah joins us now. Sarah, so great to have you here tonight. One of your most popular videos on the app is a skit. The video has more than 31 million views. Why did you decide to, to choose this medium in order to share your talent? Oh, gosh. I mean, I feel like... At this point, when I was posting on TikTok, I was homeschooled. And because of that, I had no theater. And that was kind of like my source of like creative outlet back then because I was so used to doing theater at public school. And then I didn't have that anymore because homeschool, shockingly, does not have theater. <laughs> um, and so I just started posting on the app back in 2019 when the app wasn't necessarily too big, I would say. I didn't really think that it would get me into the position that I am today, but I honestly did it just because it was a fun little hobby to do, um, just something to keep me busy as well. But look at you now. You also play the role of Ava in the Disney series Big Shot. Let's take a look. See that girl? This girl is gonna make my team better. According to TMZ, she just bit Naomi Osaka. I don't play with losers. And I never lose. At the end of each day, I want you all to look in the mirror and ask yourself, did I do my very best today? Everything you guys do in this gym and out affects all of us. Where we're going is anything but normal. How were you able to make that transition from social media to Hollywood? Oh, I mean, because I started posting so consistently on TikTok about what I just love to do, acting, I was founded by my manager. And because of that, my agency also found me. And this was back in 2019, like I said. And 
because I just posted something that I love to do, which is acting on TikTok, which got me a lot of exposure, which I did not think it would. Uh, I had already kind of like a little bit of a, a fan base um, to just like watch me. And when I got into the audition room, the, I guess, casting director saw that as well as kind of like a plus where I can kind of give them an audience as well. And that's kind of how I am where I am today because of my agents and my, my former manager as well. And now you're working alongside big time stars in the industry. Was this your dream all along? Oh, yeah. I feel like it's a dream for any upcoming actor as well. I mean, I got to work with such seasoned actors like John Stamos, which is I looked up to him so much when I was younger watching Full House. I feel like it was just like a dream come true. And I'm just so grateful and proud of myself as well. Your path to becoming an actress is quite unconventional. What advice would you have for other aspiring actors who'd love to get into the industry? I feel like breaking into the acting industry is very difficult. I mean, I had no money, no connections, and I feel like that's kind of like the key to be in this industry or just to be extremely lucky. And in my position, I got to be extremely lucky posting what I love to do on this app. And you never know who's scrolling on the For You page watching you. And I feel like now more than ever, social media really runs the world. So if I had any piece of advice for someone out there who's wanting to become an aspiring actor, actor, actress, uh, I would say probably TikTok is the best way to break through or any social media app. Especially for you, you know, social media has been so successful with your own uh, platform. You've grown more than 7 million followers there, had a, a successful acting career already. Where would you love to see yourself five years from now? Oh, that is such a loaded question. I mean, I would love to be in anything I would say just to have a duality with my acting. As of now, like I'm on Disney, which I love it so much. My Disney family is everything, but I would also love to do something ex like extremely different from what I'm doing. I would love to do something raw and something so so different from all the other characters that I've done in like the spectrum. And so I just think if I am able to have a duality with my acting career, that's what I'd love to see myself in five years. From your lips to God's ears, Sarah, we thank you so much for joining. Continued success to you. Season two of Big Shot is now out on Disney+. Plus. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, the unwelcome house guest. Hurricane Nicole continues its march up the East Coast. This man was pictured in Daytona earlier, looking at flood water in the front of his home. We are wishing everyone in the affected communities all our best and hoping that the cleanup on their end is not insurmountable. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. conservative determined to let the world know that climate change isn't just an issue liberals care about. And speaking of the climate, our Michael Strahan travels north to check in on the polar bears. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From the giant sequoias to the waterfalls, it's an amazing place. But in Yosemite, criminals go on vacation too. The park ranger found partial human remains. It was a human head. That opened the possibility of suspects. 
Henry Lee Lucas. Carrie Stainer. Donald Gibson. Any of them could have done it. We're gonna figure this thing out. Wild Crime, season two, Murder in Yosemite. Now streaming only on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us afternoons for everything you need to know. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Inflation cooled more than expected in October while consumer prices were still up 7.7%. It's the first time since February inflation has dipped below 8%. The report was seen as evidence that the Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes may be helping to ease price pressures. Senior members of Twitter's privacy and security teams have left the company according to an internal message from a company lawyer uh, that was obtained by ABC News. The lawyer also warned that Elon Musk could face legal repercussions if he fails to comply with FTC requirements to honor current employment contracts. The Twitter lawyer's message comes after Musk ended the company's work from home policy and ordered all employees to return to the office full time. And a Connecticut judge ordered InfoWars host Alex Jones to pay $473 million in punitive damages for promoting false theories about the Sandy Hook school massacre. That's on top of the nearly billion dollars in compensation Compensatory damages. A judge, a jury decided that he should pay to the plaintiffs who accused him of defamation and emotional distress. Jones repeatedly told his followers the massacre that killed 20 first graders and six educators was staged by crisis actors to enact more gun control. Jones says he will appeal and that in any case, he does not have the money. Now to the aftermath of the midterms with control of Congress still up in the air. Several House races remain undecided as Republicans move closer to taking over that body. And the Senate still remains deadlocked with who will hold the majority depending on the outcome of three states, Georgia, which is heading to a runoff, and Arizona and Nevada, which are both still too close to call. So when will we know which way voters in those states will cast their ballots? ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran reports from Phoenix tonight. Here in Maricopa County, they're counting the votes and they've still got a long way to go. More than 400,000 ballots are left. The Republican chairman of the county board tells us that in Arizona, where 90% of the voters vote by mail, this is how elections work. There's nothing wrong with the, what's going on. This is the process. It's been like this for years. Each ballot must be signature checked, scanned, and verified by a bipartisan board by law. Candidates in the tight Senate race reassuring their supporters. Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly. It doesn't look like we're going to have the final results for a little while. And that's okay. And his Republican opponent, Blake Masters, tweeting simply, with the remaining ballots outstanding, we are confident we will win. In Nevada, ballots postmarked by Election Day are still arriving. Officials here explaining each one will be verified and counted, a painstaking process. We couldn't go any faster now, even if we wanted to. But like Arizona, the candidates here, too, remaining calm. We know this will take time, and uh, we won't have more election results for several days. We're confident that the numbers are there and we're gonna win this race. Arizona's Democratic candidate for governor also urged patience. Prepare for a long evening and a few more days of counting. But her Republican opponent, Carrie Lake, a longtime election denier, taking a darker tone. We had a big day today and don't let those cheaters and crooks think anything different. Today, Lake suggested a conspiracy is at work, accusing officials of deliberately, quote, slow rolling the results, but offering no proof. Our thanks to Terry. Tonight, we are tracking Hurricane Nicole's deadly wrath and the fallout from the strongest storm to hit Florida this late in the year in roughly four decades. The storm has left a path of destruction behind, including areas where Hurricane Ian struck just six weeks ago. And tonight, that storm is moving north. We'll have the latest track in a moment with Rob Marciano. But first, Victor Akendo reports in from Florida. Tonight, a rare November hurricane cutting a path of destruction along Florida's Atlantic coast. The latest landfall in nearly 40 years. Authorities say at least 19 hotels and condos, as well as 40 homes in Volusia County, have been damaged or destroyed.
There's some buildings that have been partially collapsed. Dan Freebus has lived in Daytona Beach Shores for 64 years. He says it will never be the same. How many people had to evacuate in this area? I, I had four or five people walk up to me wondering where they're going to live. In nearby Daytona Beach, the powerful storm surge and massive waves causing severe erosion, sending multiple beachfront homes collapsing into the ocean, this swimming pool dangling on the edge. Our Ginger Z is there. This home yesterday, I was in the living room. That is now in the ocean. They used to have, before Ian, a deck and 100 feet before you hit water. This is how fast erosion can change a coast. These homes were not sitting on cliffs two months ago. No. Tell me about what it looked like before Ian and before Nicole. We've heard people say you shouldn't build on a cliff. There, there weren't cliffs here. These were not cliffs. These were walkovers that were, again, you had a ton of space. So this is just... It's just absolutely devastating. Nicole roaring ashore in the middle of the night, making landfall near Vero Beach as a Category 1 storm. Wind gusts topping 80 miles per hour, ripping down trees and power lines. Nicole blamed for at least four deaths tonight, including a man and woman electrocuted by a downed power line in Orange County. Nicole dumping more than half a foot of rain, combined with the storm surge, triggering major flooding in St. Augustine and parts of Jacksonville. And tonight, NASA inspecting the $4 billion Artemis One moon rocket for damage after officials kept it on the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. That area lasted with intense wind gusts when Nicole came ashore. Just amazing scenes there, thanks to Victor. Now let's get straight to ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano with more on where Nicole is heading next. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, well, Georgia and Atlanta, it's next on the docket here. But right now, Nicole is dipping his toes back into water in the Gulf of Mexico, just south of Tallahassee. Here it is on the radar. You see that swirl there. It'll move inland soon enough, about 80 miles south of Tallahassee. But the impact's well away from center. Tropical storm force winds 175 miles out. And we have tornado warning earlier today in Charleston. Tornado watches have been extended into North Carolina, so that will be an overnight threat. Our computer models bring this north to just south of Atlanta by tomorrow morning. It's going to be a rainy, windy rush hour here in the ATL. And then as it pushes up across the Appalachians, even slicing across the Ohio River Valley, we'll see a severe weather threat for parts of the Carolinas. Then into the mid-Atlantic by midday and then pushing into the northeast. Look at the heavy rain coming into Philadelphia, into Newark and New York by the rush hour tomorrow afternoon. And there'll be some heavy rain and obviously some wind with this. How much rain do we expect? Well, good news is this moving fairly quickly. So the inland flooding that we so are worried about with, with hurricanes uh, probably won't materialize, but there'll be spotty areas of seeing some flooding. I think coastal flooding and coastal erosion will be the calling card here. But the wind and the rain will certainly down, take down more trees and power lines over the next 24 to 36 hours. Lindsay? Glad to hear it's at least moving quickly. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Now to the war in Ukraine and the staggering new figures on the toll taken by the war. An estimated 100,000 killed or injured on each side, 200,000 casualties, and another 40,000 civilians killed. This is the Russians retreat from a key city and that continues tonight, but some Ukrainian officials fear it may all be a trap. ABC's James Longman has more. Tonight, reports of explosions in the city of Kherson. Ukrainian troops are moving closer after Russia announced its withdrawal. These videos shared by Ukrainian soldiers show villages in the area being liberated. They found Russian positions deserted and Ukrainian flags and villagers welcoming them. But some top Ukrainian officials are warning of a trap that the Russians are laying mines and readying artillery strikes to turn it into a, quote, city of death. The retreat comes after weeks of relentless pressure. This aerial reconnaissance unit has been operating in the Kherson region. How important would you say your work is at the moment? Uh, OK, I understand. Uh, where are the eyes of the army, actually? Because uh, uh, previously, it was very hard to help the artillery from, uh, like, uh, from the ground level. Now, this is the, obviously the drone here. It gets loaded up uh, with this grenade. That would normally sit uh, under the barrel of a gun. You've got the detonator at the front here. And then this at the back, this is a fin which has been attached, and that's been made using a 3D printer. And in a show of its continued support for Ukraine, the United States is now providing powerful new defensive weapons. They include short-range air defense missiles that can protect against cruise missiles, helicopters and unmanned drones. 
The U.S. believes Putin's setbacks have now opened a window of opportunity for talks. But Ukraine believes it's tried negotiation with the Russian leader and he's never kept his word. So much uncertainty still. Our thanks to James Longman. In two separate incidents, four tourists in Mexico City were found dead due to carbon monoxide poisoning. ABC's Matt Rivers has this story. The families of four tourists killed by carbon monoxide poisoning in two different Mexico City vacation rentals demanding answers. This can't happen anymore. Authorities say Americans Candace Florence, Jordan Marshall, and Cortez Hall were all found dead in their Airbnb rental on October 30th. Florence's family telling ABC News they were in town to join Day of the Dead celebrations. She just loved being in the presence of other people and just feeling how, how they live. They say the 28-year-old spoke to her boyfriend on the phone that day and told him she wasn't feeling well. She said, uh, I was vomiting and dizzy and my legs are wobbly. Authorities say they arrived at the scene to find the bodies of the three friends all dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. Airbnb suspending the listing and canceling upcoming reservations, telling ABC News, quote, our priority now is to provide support to those affected while the authorities investigate what happened and we are available to cooperate with the investigation in any way we can. But that same weekend, just a few miles away, another death from carbon monoxide. 29-year-old Angelica Arce was staying in a non-Airbnb vacation rental with her siblings, Andrea and Marco, when they started to feel sick. One minute, actually and I felt really dizzy. Andrea and Marco telling our San Diego affiliate KGTV that Angelica was treated for heat exhaustion at the hospital and went back to the rental to sleep. But a few hours later, Marco found her lifeless. I lipped uh, her hair and she was all purple. I was very scared. These deaths, just the latest in a disturbing trend among vacationers. In May, three U.S. tourists were killed by carbon monoxide poisoning at a sandals resort in the Bahamas. Not all rental companies mandate that their properties have functioning carbon monoxide detectors. The victims' families now calling for more regulation. We will fight to make sure that mandates are implemented so no other family has to deal with this type of brokenness and heartache. Such scary scenarios there. Thanks to Matt Rivers. President Biden is set to speak at the climate conference COP27 in Egypt tomorrow. Biden is expected to boast of returning the U.S. into the global fight against climate change after passing that landmark climate bill. But it's a message that leaders of developing countries might not be ready to receive. All week they've been blasting the U.S. and industrialized nations for causing climate change. And now those leaders would like reparations. If the GOP does take back control, the House climate legislation may be stalled. But there are some conservative climate advocates. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z introduces us to a young Republican who says saving the planet is not just a concern for Democrats. Any young Republican that's running for office across the country believes that climate change should be a priority. We need more of those candidates to win. Uh, we need more of sort of the next generation of Republicans to win who believe that climate change is a priority. Benji Becker is a 24-year-old conservative from Wisconsin who has the ear of many high-profile Republicans. His goal? Get them to talk about climate change. Hosting conferences, traveling the country, and lobbying from his office near the Hill, hoping that the incoming Congress includes Republicans who support proactive climate policy. Oh, cool. And if that happens, we'll see something that a lot of people don't think is possible, which is that action on climate change under a Republican House. If Republicans do win the House, I think it's very possible for that to happen. Our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. The midterms happening at the same time as COP27, the largest climate change conference in the world. It brings together world leaders, policymakers, and Free activists. This year taking place in Egypt. As conservatives are poised to take control of the House, few have included climate policy in their midterm platforms. But Benji wants to help reverse that trend. Can you tell me what does it mean to have a conservative stance on climate policy. It sounds, when you first hear it, like, hold on, explain that. Conservative stance on climate policy, please explain. We believe in nuclear energy. We believe in 
uh, American leadership because American economic growth is good for the world and if we can provide low cost technology to other countries, that's a win. We believe in streamlining regulations that are unnecessary, that put us in a place where we can't help fight climate change. And the goal would be in 2023, 2025, every year there's a new Congress or a new president that you aren't worried about climate inaction because of who's in power. It's just a matter of who's going to have to work more with the other side. We're not having a one-size-fits-all approach to the environment. And in a time when our generation is so disgruntled, we're going in there and we're saying, no, we have answers. My freshman year of college, I searched conservative environmental organization, nothing. Conservative climate organization, nothing. And that's when I realized I had to do it myself. That organization became the American Conservation Coalition. Its goal, building the conservative environmental movement. We are at the first ACC summit. We have just under 300 attendees, which is absolutely incredible for the first time that this is being held. I'm here because I am a conservative environmentalist, and I think it's really important that we create that movement and make it like a valid movement. I think for a long time, conservatives have not come to the table. It's the people in this room that will change the narrative. There are tens of billions of dollars being spent on the current way of thinking on the environment, and it's not working. Benji's reputation and his enthusiasm attracting several high-profile Republicans, like Texas Representative Dan Crenshaw. I think the Republican Party has come a long way on this, and Benji's that next generation of that. And former Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, who just happens to be the wife of Kentucky Senator and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. To conserve is probably the most conservative principle of all. And all Americans, regardless of their backgrounds or political stripes, want clean air, clean water, and a healthy planet for future generations. If Benji seems comfortable around politicians, it's because he is. He's been doing this for more than 10 years. His whole journey started in Wisconsin when he was just 12 years old, volunteering for his political hero, Scott Walker and soon becoming a real conservative media darling. Benji Backer joins us live now from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Benji, welcome to the program. Even speaking at CPAC at age 16. I'm a product of the Wisconsin public school system, which is one of the best in the country. But it hasn't always been easy for a conservative thinker. So for conservative climate activists, they are the largest youth-led group in the country. They're really focusing on insider tactics where they work directly to lobby and speak with elected officials to make sure their voices are heard and their perspective is heard. How do you reconcile, as an environmentalist, the Republicans' relationship with fossil fuels? That's a big one. Yeah. When you hear drill, baby, drill, what I, do you feel? Both sides have been in bed with fossil fuels for a long time. Republicans maybe a little bit longer now that Democrats have started to cut that off. But we need to work with fossil fuel companies while we still have fossil fuels. But the UN and scientists around the world say, stop, stop as soon as you can. Well, they say, they say start moving away from them as soon as you can, but we're not moving away from them tomorrow. We're gonna need solutions within the fossil fuel industry and outside the fossil fuel industry. There are a number of conservatives who now acknowledge that there is a climate crisis. They acknowledge that humans are causing it, but they don't necessarily agree about how to solve that problem. But for Benji, Back here in the nature that he loves so much, even a small step is one in the right direction. I want people to always remember that what we're doing is because of this. We're always caught in the middle because we're trying to fight for common sense solutions in the middle, and that ends up creating a lot of enemies, and it also goes against the grain of what anyone thinks is possible. And so every day, I met with tens if not hundreds of no's. But for every yes that comes from that and every meeting that I can get that can move the ball forward, that's what it's all about. And still to come, why a ship full of migrants is now leading the French to back out of an agreement with Italy. And he was wrongly convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Isaac Wright tells us about his new book, detailing how he not only got his own case overturned while in prison, but also the cases of his fellow inmates.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A suspected terrorist killed one police officer and injured another in Brussels, Belgium. The suspect was heard shouting a religious phrase before attacking a police patrol with a knife. Backup officers shot and then arrested the suspect. The family of an Egyptian-British political prisoner is calling on leaders at the COP27 climate talks for help. The man has been on a hunger strike since April, and he vowed to stop drinking water four days ago to coincide with the opening of the talks. Today, prison authorities reported they were giving the pro-democracy activist medical attention. And France has agreed to allow a humanitarian ship carrying more than 200 migrants to dock in one of its ports. The ship has been stranded in Italian waters awaiting permission to dock for days. But in retaliation to France, back, France is backing out of an agreement to accept thousands of migrants currently in Italian processing facilities. Italian authorities say that others aren't holding up their end of a European deal struck this summer for migrant resettlement programs. About 90,000 migrants have arrived in Italy this year, and just over 100 of them have been resettled in other European countries. Turning now to the incredible true story of one man's fight for justice. Back in 1989 in New Jersey, Isaac Wright Jr., a 28-year-old music producer, husband and father, was wrongfully convicted of being a drug kingpin and sentenced to life in prison. Wright's new book, Marked for Life, One Man's Fight for Justice from the Inside, details his journey to freedom, helping to overturn 20 of his fellow inmates' convictions, and then finally his own. Now an attorney, he's helping people just like him. Isaac Wright Jr. joins us now. Thank Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. You go into quite a bit of detail about what you believe led to your arrest. Summarize that for us and, and what was going through your head at the time. I walked into a situation when I moved to New Jersey uh, that I wasn't prepared for. Um, very successful young man, um, you know, in the prime of my life, doing the best that I could to raise, uh, raise a family and to be successful. And that turned out uh, to be an Achilles heels. Um, I, I came under target of this particular uh, prosecutor, um, first based on some acquaintances. It was the appearance of wealth. Um, and, and that became the beginning of the end for me. And when you refused to take a plea deal and decided to represent yourself, what doubts did you have at the time? The first time I got convicted, of anything I I got life in prison for so I, I was not I was I was new to this and so it was a, a, an incredible shock not just the charges um, and the fact that I was facing life but my experience within the system the things that I found out about how the system really worked about how the people uh, in the system treated uh, others uh, that were subject um, to their authority 
so that was a, an incredible wake up call. Uh, and, and I had to do something about it. I, mean, I, I, I found myself alone. Uh, and when I say that, this is very important for me to say, when, when, when I say I was alone, I'm not saying I didn't have family and people that, that didn't love me and people that didn't support me. The system is set up to isolate you from that. Uh, without your attorney, you are truly alone. And with your attorney, if he's not set to do the right things for you, then you're even more alone. You're in more trouble with an attorney that's not going to do the right thing for you than you are um, representing yourself. Um, so I, I, I had to choose the what I believed was the best of both evils, and that was, you know, to represent myself. You were sentenced to life. How much time did you actually serve? I was sentenced to life on just one charge. I was sentenced to approximately 70 years on the other charges. And um, I served seven and a half years in prison before I was able to turn it all around. It, why was it so important for you to see your fellow inmates' convictions overturned before your own? Now, I, I had no idea that I, that I had a gift until I went to prison. And I understood even, you know, getting told no, even losing motions, I understood that I had something that was different. Uh, and I saw the difference in what I had in terms of my ability to understand the law and to litigate it and what they had. And they needed help. They were also alone. And what I was going through was projected on my empathy for what they were actually going through. So it was, it was, it was not only uh, a sense of obligation, but it was also a way that I was able to fight back. I was just not fighting back with my case. I was fighting back with all the injustices that has surrounded me. I can only imagine. Your story inspired the ABC show For Life, and you're now cementing your journey in this book, Marked for Life. What's next for you? Uh, there's a number of things uh, that's coming up uh, that I'm very excited about. Um, you know, 50 and I are, are working on something that, um, you know, we're kind of keeping under wraps uh, until the, the first quarter of next year. It's a, it's a very exciting endeavor, very um, happy about it, and I, and I think it's going to do a lot of public good. Um, there's also, uh, I'm, I'm drifting into the finance world. I'm, you know, as a part of, of what I experienced, uh, one of the things about reentry is, you know, it's very, very difficult for people coming back into the world to find their footing. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to start an organization or working on starting an organization. And so worthwhile all that you are doing. Isaac, we thank you so much for your time. His book, Marked for Life, One Man's Fight for Justice from the Inside, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, going on a subarctic mission with Michael Strahan as he discovers just how much climate change is threatening the existence of polar bears. If you don't mind, I'm going to warm up my voice in front of you. You have preconceived notions of what a pop star is going to be like, and he is not at all like that. Well, this doesn't suck. I wasn't exactly encouraged to tell my story. No one really knew me and what I was like. The impact of Charlie Puth. This is the song that I have to end every set with for the rest of my life. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. ABC's own Michael Strahan has set out on an ice safari. He traveled to the subarctic in Canada, exploring how climate change is threatening the existence of entire species, polar bears. 
Our adventure begins aboard this Tundra buggy. This is awesome. I love this. We set out on an ice safari searching for these great white bears. There's nowhere else like this anywhere in the world where you can go and just see, you know, polar bears up close from this kind of distance. And then... Oh, there he is right there. How amazing is that? Wow. Look at that. That is amazing. They've been with mom for about 10 months. They're still nursing, living off mom's milk, but learning how to be a polar bear. Now, how long do they stay with mom? They'll stay with mom for two to three years, two and a half on average. Then they go their separate ways. Wow. It's like they're putting on a show. And this time of year, they're just like waiting for the ice, so they're just hanging out, laying around. The sea ice that formed in fall is essential for polar bear survival. It allows the bears to go far enough out to prey on seals and store up fat to get them through spring and summer. Because of global warming, there are now shorter sea ice seasons, which gives the bears less time to hunt for food, resulting in less healthy bears. And if female bears don't get enough food, they can't maintain their weight to carry a pregnancy, resulting in fewer polar bears worldwide. How do they know when, the, when OK, this is the time to go now? They'll go out and they start testing it, spreading their paws out. And as soon as there's enough ice for them to be out hunting seals, they're gone. Ahoy. We meet up with Buggy One, Polar Bear International's Tundra office on wheels, and we arrive to a bounty of bears. We're here. We got two polar bears that would say laying in the sun, but no, they're laying in the cold. But they look cute from up here. We got another polar bear who's over there, a little more active, not just laying down like the other two. But they are big, beautiful, kind of like me. Inside this buggy, the team is presenting research via live stream to the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. We really can make a difference, truly. Scientist Elisa McCall and chief scientist Dr. Stephen Amstrup, a pioneer in polar bear research, report on the increasing threat of climate change to polar bears. What is the message that you wanted to convey there? We're here talking about polar bears and melting sea ice and connecting that to societies around the world. Outside, we see two polar bears sparring. They're kind of testing each other's prowess. Who's the toughest? This time of year, it's kind of practice. And then hopefully in the spring, Bob knows, hey, that guy's a lot tougher than I am. I'm not no. even going to mess with him. He can have her. Sounds like life. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and they're here just waiting for the ice shelf to freeze over. That's right. Yeah. But now, because of climate change, it's a little bit later in the season that That's they're right. able to go out. But it also melts as the world warms. Yeah. So their habitat is among the fastest changing of habitats anywhere. So now, more and more polar bears are venturing into town hungry. There can be a bear anywhere at any time of year make it a plan for coexistence necessary. The Polar Bear Alert Program offers a 24-hour hotline to help. We keep people safe, we keep bears safe, we stop negative bear behavior, such as food conditioning and habituation, we protect property from bears, and we keep our staff safe here in Churchill. And sometimes they need to be relocated safely. We'll put it in a big cargo net and we will literally strap it onto the bottom of a helicopter and then we fly that bear out in the direction it's trying to go. Back out in the tundra, I see one up close. Wow, beautiful. We've been talking about polar bears in the climate for, for quite a few years. What have you seen change within the last few years? One of the things that really brings urgency to the situation now is we realize that we've warmed the world enough that we are passing the warmest temperature that it's ever been in the polar bear's evolutionary history. So the future is kind of uh, unknown in terms of how polar bears will respond. But for now, the polar bears sit and wait. As much as we're curious about him, he's curious about us. But now he's decided to take a seat that looks really fun. Our thanks to Michael for that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. We thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.
It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, 